Well, good morning, church. Happy Labor Day to you all. I guess that's tomorrow, so a little premature, but uh, happy Labor Day weekend to you. The official end of summer, the start of fall. You can kind of feel it in the air, right? Not in the afternoons, but in the mornings and the, the evenings, there's a chill coming. Football has started. It is a, it is a good time of year. Go dogs. Let's let it be said. Uh, 1-0. Oh, we're on a streak. Here we go. Um, actually, 16-0. Oh. We've, won, uh, we've won a lot. It's been good. Good season to be a Georgia Bulldog fan, but uh, glad you're here. If you're brand new, I want to welcome you. We are so excited that you're here uh, to worship with us this morning. We are uh, in the midst of a series looking at the gospel of Luke, studying the life of Jesus, uh, encountering the real Jesus. Uh, and, and that's what we do here. We just go verse by verse by verse by verse through books of the Bible. So today we're in chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and join me there. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 27 because we finished up with verse 26 last week. We're going to go all the way to, to 36 this morning. But I'll, I'll start with this. It was... Uh, it was Wednesday morning this week, 7.15 a.m. in the morning, and I was on my way up here to the office to work on this exact sermon when everything went horribly wrong. And I'll, I'm going to assume most of you are not preachers, so I need to give you a little bit of context as to how writing a sermon works. I mean, you've probably not written sermons before, but... but uh, Sermon writing is a, is a strange and unusual thing to do. Uh, there's a lot of it that's, that, that's really enjoyable. You know, studying God's word deeply, you start off just sort of reading the words of whatever passage you're preaching and, and looking at the original languages, trying to understand what it's saying. That's all really fun. And then you sort of move to, to commentaries, reading what other pastors and preachers have, uh, have written about uh, this passage through time, sort of making sure you're not, you know, blind and seeing things that aren't actually there, making sure other people have seen them too. All that's fun too. I, I'm Pastor, I like to read. I, I enjoy uh, studying the old dead guys who have written some amazing things. So enjoy that part too. Um, there's, there's the part of brainstorming and trying to like put together ideas. Once you see truth in the Bible, you're trying to like form it into some sort of an outline, some truths that might be you know, useful for people to hear. Uh, that part's fun as well. But then comes the moment when you just got to write the thing. Right? Like, I don't like stepping up here without knowing what I'm going to say. I actually feel like manuscripts are important. Being careful with the words you say while preaching is really important. So, you know, together with the other pastors here, we, we work hard to write out every single word that we're thinking through, every single word we intend to say. And, and for me, that happens on Wednesdays. So I had sort of set it aside. I'd done the work Monday and Tuesday to study. I woke up early Wednesday morning, had a good workout, uh, got dressed, read my Bible, and uh, I'm taking the kids to school, going to drop them off, head to the office, and, and, and knock this thing out, right? Got a, got a plan. I'm working the plan. I'm trying to make it happen. And uh, I'm, I'm five minutes away from my house. I'm making a turn. And that's when the full, hot cup of coffee holding in my hand slips out and somehow just douses me all over my lap with coffee. And immediately several things go horribly wrong. Like first I'm soaked, I'm soaked. I didn't just like, like tip the coffee, the whole mug spills and it's like, I'm sitting in a pool of coffee and it's running down my legs, into my shoes, it's filling the bottom of my truck, like it's awful. Number two, I'm also like on fire. This coffee was not cold. I just refilled my mug right before I got in the car. So this thing is hot. I mean, it's not McDonald's, McDonald's lawsuit hot. Like it's, you know, I'm not going to sue myself over this incident, but I'm, I'm not comfortable. Like this is, this is, you know, this is bad. This is not going well. Third, I realize I'm stuck because if I turn around to go fix this problem, I'm only five minutes away from the house, but I didn't leave myself enough time. Like the kids will be late for school if I do this. So I've got to keep going and sit in this mess for another 20 minutes well, I drop them off, turn around, come back and clean up, which means fourth, I'm going to be late. Like here I have this great, perfectly efficient plan for getting this work done today, getting this sermon written, and, and now that's not going to work out. Uh, so fifth, I'm angry. Like I'm just upset at this whole thing. I'm mad at myself. I'm mad at the coffee mug. Uh, I know this sermon is going to have an edge to it as I write it that day. It's going to be, you know, extra caffeinated. It's, uh, it's not good. And then sixth, I'm just frustrated because I know I'm being attacked by Satan. Like, I've never spilled a cup, a cup of coffee this way in my life before. Like, like, I don't do things like this. I don't know what happened. It wasn't a slip. It was that ancient snake, man. He came in and hit that, that cup. It, it knocked into my lap. It was the worst. I was so frustrated. You know, it's that feeling when, when you got a plan and you're working it, and then sudden, suddenly something jumps in and just interrupts everything, throws the whole thing off track. I mean, you've been there before. Like, anybody else hate interruptions in life? Like, you know, those moments when 
you're in a conversation and you've got a good point to make. Like you've thought it out, you're, you're trying to get there and, and then the other person just like speaks up and you lose your train of thought and it was gonna be funny, everybody was gonna laugh like, and now you can't even say it, they interrupted you or those moments when you're running late somewhere but you got just enough time and, and, and you're, you're on your way, you're, you're gonna make it but then like the slowest driver in the world pulls out in front of you and just messes up the plan, or, or you're, you're in your office, you're getting work done, and, and somebody decides, just stop by and say hello. Uh, you know, company, as Pastor Anson talked about a few weeks ago, like uh, the frustrating moments that happen when, when you have a plan and you get interrupted. I, I say all that, family, because that's exactly how our passage begins this morning. Jesus, here in this text, he is, he's in the midst of a longer conversation. If you're joining us this morning, I encourage you, if you weren't here last week, go back and listen to that sermon because everything Jesus says today, it's a transitory passage. It follows immediately what he said last week. And next week, too, is a part of this same conversation. We're in the midst of like a one big moment between Jesus and the Pharisees where it all connects together. And it began, if you want to look in your Bibles, it began last week in in verse 14 with this moment when Jesus heals a mute man. He's possessed by a demon. The demon has made him mute. You remember this from the sermon last week. And and Jesus uh, casts out the demon, cleans this man, and he's healed with a supernatural demonstration of power. And the Pharisees who are standing nearby in this moment, they don't receive this as good news. They actually start to complain to the other people in the crowd watching Jesus, and they say, he did this by the power of Satan. They accuse Jesus of doing this healing by Satan's power. Some of them say they want another sign. They don't believe that he's really the Messiah. And Jesus, last week we saw this, he refutes them. Like he gives this brilliant defense of himself. Uh, he, He lays down this line in the sand with these Pharisees. Verse 23, he says, if you're not with me, you're against me. Which is, uh, you know, Pastor Anson did a great job of unpacking that, applying it to our lives last week. But I want you to remember how, like, controversial that statement would have been in that crowd. Jesus, Pharisees, some other people hanging out in the crowd. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. Like, they're the most, this is a very religious culture. Israel, like, they all worship God. They're the highest, most respected people in the culture. They're like, you know, the pastors, the, the, the shepherds, the men that, that everybody in the crowd would have respected. And Jesus is looking at them and saying, you're not with me. You're against me. You're on the wrong side of, of God. You know, he, he's created a lot of tension in that moment. Like if you're standing there and you're one of the spectators, you can cut the tension with the knife. This is, this is a lot of... Uh, A lot of tension, the tension's thick, and he's not done. He has more to say. We're going to see that today as he dives in. But right there, right there in that moment, he gets interrupted, and it's where we'll start. Look look with me, verse 27, as this sweet woman in the crowd decides to speak up and add her voice to Jesus' rebuke of these Pharisees, and this is what she says. Verse 27, as he was saying these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. That is hilarious to me, family. <laughs> like, what is that? What is she saying there? Well, this is, this is an exclamation. This is her uh, basically saying, Jesus, I love you. And I love your mom. I'm glad she brought you into this world. Like this, is, well, I like what you're saying. This is, this is the equivalent of you if you're in a sermon and you like what's being said and you say, amen, pastor. Preach, pay the man. You know, something like that. Like I encourage you, next week, if, if Anson's preaching and you like what he's saying, scream out, blessed is your mama. Blessed is the womb that bore you, Anson. Like that's, that's what she's doing here. It's an exclamation. But, but also, don't miss it. It is also an interruption. Like she's doing that thing that we're all tempted to do when like the tension gets thick and it's a hard conversation. She's just kind of wiggling out of it. She's trying to like change the subject, break the ice a little bit, uh, trying to create a little bit of an interruption that is a distraction. And Jesus, being Jesus, he gets quickly back on track in just the, the very next verse. But before he does that, before he continues his rebuke of the Pharisees, he responds to what she said. And it's actually really interesting. I think we see something significant right here from the start. Look with me. She exclaims this, verse 27, blessed is your mama, blessed is the womb that bore you. And then Jesus replies in verse 28, but he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Which is interesting. What is that? What's he saying there? Well, he, in truth, he's, he's actually correcting this woman. 
What, what she's saying, though, though it is an interruption and a distraction, she's saying something that's incorrect that a lot of Israel's at that a lot of Israelites at that time believed, which is this: spiritual blessing comes from your family. You know, the Jews sort of assumed that their rightness with God, their relationship with God was based upon their family ties, who their father was, who their mama was, who their family was. When she's saying this, blessed is your mama, she's, she's pointing out you're blessed because your mama was blessed and she's blessed because you're blessed, this sort of family blessing. You, you can understand where it came from. The Jews were God's people. If you remember back from Genesis chapter 12, when God first established the nation of Israel, he's calling Abraham out of a different nation, a different family, and he says, go to a land I'll tell you, and I'm going to make you, Abraham, a great nation. You look at the stars in the sky. Look at the sands on, on the seashore. There's going to be more children in your family than the stars, than the sand. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. You're going to be a blessed people. And the Israelites sort of walked around and they, they viewed the other nations of the earth, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, all these other people, and they were like, you're not the people of God, we're the, people, we're the family of God. We have Abraham as our, as our father, we're blessed because we're in this family. They, they, they assumed wrongly that your, your standing with God, your right standing before God was based upon what family you were a part of. This is wrapped up in what she's saying here in this verse, and Jesus corrects her. He says, no, no, no. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. It brings us to our first point today. If you've got a pen, you want to take some notes. Number one is this. True spiritual blessing is found on the other side of obedience. It's rooted not in who's your mama, who's your daddy. It's not rooted in what family, what household you grew up in. It's rooted in obedience to the word of God. This is a promise of Jesus. Red letters here meant for all of us to read and hold fast to, and it's really significant. Don't miss this. There is real, true, promised spiritual blessing that will come to those who do two things here, hear and keep the word of God. It means obey. It means obedience. If you don't just hear the word of God, but you actually take that word that you're hearing and you put it all the way down in your heart, you keep it there until it blossoms forth into obedience. You don't stop it hearing. You actually obey. The, the word there is not obey. It's, it's keep. And the Greek word actually means to guard, to protect, to treasure something. Uh, if you remember from last week, remember uh, Jesus was talking about like the strong man who, who guards his treasure. It's the same word there, exact same word uh, there as it is here. Like that's what we're supposed to do with the word of God. We're not supposed to just be hearers only when we listen to sermons on Sunday mornings. We're not just supposed to be hearers only when we have our quiet times in the morning. There's something that should happen in our souls where that word goes past our ears and is kept, guarded, treasured, protected like a great treasure of great value down in your soul until it starts to burst forth in obedience. He's not just saying, just keep it in your heart. That kind of treasuring inevitably leads to obedience. This is bigger than just, uh, you know, what we might think of what it means to be a follower of Christ. We're getting to the heart of discipleship here. We're getting to the place where, like, the sheep and the goats are separated, where we start to determine who really is a follower of Jesus and who's not. There's a lot of people who hear the word of God. Like, in this crowd, as Jesus is speaking, there's a lot of people listening to him. But Jesus already taught us not all who hear obey. Remember the parable of the sower? We studied this back in March. Pastor Brad preached it. This is from Luke chapter 8. You can go read it earlier. But, but Jesus teaches us something really valuable there, which is about how the word of God goes forth in our life. You know, a, a sower goes and scatters it. That could be a preacher. That could be you, know, you sitting in your quiet time and the, and the, the word of God, the Bible being, being uh, laid before your eyes and you're hearing it. And, and uh, in that parable, Jesus says there's four types of ways to receive it, four soils that that seed falls on. There's the hard soil, those with hard hearts, it just sort of falls on the ground and never penetrates. You know, it gets crushed by the, 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 uh, the, the cars on the road that'll pass over it because it never fell into the soil. It gets stolen away by the birds of the air, that passage says, because it didn't ever go into the soil. You just hear it and it go, you go right back to your life. You come on Sunday, you hear a good sermon, good job preacher, now back to, it's Labor Day weekend, let's go to the lake, you know? That's the hard soil. Then there's this thorny soil. And this is interesting. Tune in here because I want you to inspect your heart against the word of God when he's talking about hearing and obeying. The thorny soil, he says, the word of God enters, it goes into the soil, but as it starts to grow, it's, it's growing, like it's, 
it, it's becoming fruitful, like it's starting to, to rise up in there, but as it's growing, the cares of this life grow up like thorns around it and choke it out. Your concerns about your kids, your concerns about your marriage, your concerns about your career, you get to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday that week, and you've totally forgotten what God said on Sunday. The cares of this life choke out what's going, you've heard it, but you haven't obeyed. It hasn't been kept in your soul. Third, there's, there's rocky soil. Jesus says this is the, the kind of uh, people who hear the word of God. It does enter, it starts to grow, but they don't put down roots. They don't water the, the, the plant rightly, and, and so it doesn't grow strong. And therefore, the moment life gets hard, as soon as that sun starts to beat down on it, it doesn't have deep enough roots to pull up nutrition, it falls away. These are folks who don't endure, who don't guard the word of God hard enough to let it endure through the, through the, the times when you actually need it. And then fourthly, there's the good soil. And Jesus says, these are the people who hear the word of God, it goes down in and it starts to grow and they put down deep roots and it keeps growing even when it gets hot and eventually it grows into a strong plant that can yield 10, 20, 100 times the fruit that it had at first. Family, the point there in that passage is the same as Jesus' point here. Spiritual blessing, abundant life, the life you want to have in Christ doesn't just come from hearing the word. It comes from obeying it. The deep impact doesn't just come from the meteor that, that skips by and bounces off the atmosphere, but the one that sinks in deep and changes everything. The one who guards the word, treasures it, seeks to obey it, is the one that gets to enjoy the abundant life, the blessing that God has. And I'll warn you now, it's not easy. And you know this. We talk about this all the time here at church. Like, it, it is easy when you like the word of God, when, when the thing that Jesus is saying to you, the thing that God is confronting you with is, is something you want to obey. And there's those moments, you know, the word of God is like, uh, Deuteronomy talks about it being, you know, it's like bread to our souls. It nourishes us. We need the word of God more than we need bread. And who doesn't like eating bread? Sometimes when you're going to read your Bible and you're going to walk away feeling warm and full and and uh, satisfied family, but, but Hebrews 4 tells us that the word of God is also not just like bread, it's also like a double-edged sword. That there's moments where you're gonna read it and it's gonna slice you right open, leave you exposed before God, naked and exposed, it actually says. And that's not comfortable. It, it, it feels like surgery, it feels like something's being cut out of you, because it is. God's word is meant to like dig into you and pull out the things that are bad. When that's happening, I'm telling you right now, you will not like it. Everything in you will not want to hear and guard the word, it'll want to run from the word. Like when money is tight, when you're living hand to mouth, you don't have enough to get by and, and suddenly the word of God tells you you're supposed to be generous. You're supposed to give to the poor. You're supposed to give to your church. You're supposed to not live off of everything you have, but give some of it away. And you're like, I can't even live on what I have. How am I supposed to do this, Lord? And I'm supposed to do it with joy? I'm supposed to be a cheerful giver? When your marriage is a disaster, when every moment, every day is hard, all you want to do is cut and run. And then the word of God comes to you and strikes your heart and says, what God has joined together, let not man separate family it's hard to obey you just want to scream back to God you don't know my circumstances you wrote that when it you you weren't aware of what I'm walking through Lord when you're in life and somebody betrays you a friend a colleague somebody hurts you deeply and you are just wounded so much and all you want to do is be vengeful and, and respond and give back what's happened to you. And the word of God strikes you and says, beloved, this is Romans 12, beloved, never avenge yourself. Never. Leave it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And then you're reading in Colossians 3 and it says, forgive one another from a sincere heart. Family, these moments, I'm telling you, it's hard to obey. Everything in you wants to just wiggle out of it. Just like this lady, you want to change the subject. You want to think about something else. You don't want to take the word in and let it grow. But family, it is there. Hear me. It is there. It is right there where obedience matters the most. It is right there where you determine whether Jesus is actually your Lord or you're your Lord. Like if he only gets to call the shots when you like his calls, family, you're not obeying him. You're obeying yourself. If he only gets to drive when you like where he's going, but every time you want to make a different turn, you grab the steering wheel and pull it back, family, he's not driving, you are. 
Don't let the Lord Jesus be subservient to you in your own heart. Don't let him be a framed picture on the wall of your heart, but somebody that's not allowed to sit on the throne at all, family. God is calling us all into true obedience that lets the Lord lead. And on the other side of that, when you actually obey, when you press in in the hard moments and you let that word take root, you let it grow, you guard it, you don't let your heart twist out of it, on the other side of it, Jesus is promising us here there's blessing. Real blessing, rich blessing, abundant blessing. It's not found by those who just hear the word. It's found by those who keep it. It doesn't matter who your mom is. It doesn't matter who your daddy is. It doesn't matter who's your pastor, what church you attend, how theologically faithful they are. Those things are important, family. But the most important thing is, are you hearing the word of God? Are you obeying it? Blessing isn't found in a club. It's found in Christ. That's where Jesus starts. And having handled that distraction, which is, that's what it was, a nice distraction from sweet, sweet Susie the saint, uh, Jesus gets right back on with his rebuke of the Pharisees. Look with me. We're going to continue this. Verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, the Greek there is as the crowds were pressing in. So the same moment. This isn't a new moment. When the crowds were increasing, he, Jesus, began to say, this generation is an evil generation. How about that for a loving word from the Lord, Right? It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will also rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Okay, let's pause again. We've got a little bit more that we'll cover at the end, but, but want to stop and tackle this. What's going on here? Well, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees. He's getting right back into the confrontation that began last week, and, uh, and here he's responding actually to something the Pharisees said. Look back at verse 16 real quickly. Uh, the Pharisees there, some of them it says were we're calling Jesus, you know, a servant of Satan, of Beelzebul. But then others say they want a sign from heaven. They're asking Jesus for more signs. They want to see more than just this mute man being healed and all the other miracles that he's done. And into this, Jesus is now responding. This generation is evil. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given. And in this response, in these verses we just read, I see a rebuke and then an analogy that he's giving the Pharisees. And both are really revealing. I want to look at each one. First, the rebuke. Jesus calls them evil. Look at verse 29. He says, this generation is an evil generation for seeking a sign. Does that, does that like mess with your heart a little bit? It did me when I was first reading this. Like, what are you saying there, Jesus? It seems kind of rough. Like these guys just, they're doubting, right? Like they just want another sign. Like why are you responding to them sincerely asking for evidence from you with such a strong hand? Like their faith is weak. Help them along. Have some compassion. Give them the sign, Lord. The problem is, family, that's not the issue here. I do think there's a kind of doubt that is sincere. There's a kind of sincere, genuine searching that looks to God for answers. And all throughout the Bible, God responds to that with a lot of love. You just go read the story of Doubting Thomas if, if you want to, and you'll see that there. And the story of John the Baptist when he's in prison as well. Doubters do get the love of the Lord. I don't think that's the problem with the Pharisees at all. Their issue is not that they're doubting. Their issue is disbelief. They've had plenty of signs. Again and again, they've seen Jesus do miracles. We've seen that this whole study through Luke so far. So what's really going on here? They're not doubting, family. They're making excuses to avoid obedience. They don't like the things Jesus is saying, so they're claiming, they're having this mask of, oh, we need another sign, and then we'll follow him. But in, in truth, in their hearts, they have no intention of ever following him. They don't like Jesus. And we can understand why. Like, the Pharisees, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but they were very powerful in this day. They're the, the religious elite in a very religious culture. Everybody wants to be them. And they used the law and their perfect obedience. They had, you know, they had found every law in the Old Testament. They had made up some new ones, and Perfect obedience, that's who the Pharisees were. And they used that to elevate themselves in the culture. We, we tithe our, our mint and our dill. We, we don't even walk on the Sabbath. We don't do anything wrong. Like we're perfectly obedient. And by, by following the law in this way, they actually put down everybody else. So religion and obedience for them was not a means of being faithful to God. Don't miss this. In their hearts, religion and obedience was all about self-exaltation. 
And Jesus was confronting that power big time again and again. Jesus was never harsher with anybody than the Pharisees in the Gospels. He is loving and kind to sinners. Prostitutes treats him with grace. But look at the Pharisees again and again. He confronts them. He says things like, true religion is of the heart. It's not a show. Don't, don't say your prayers on a street corner with a lot of words like, God knows what you need. Just get in the closet and pray, Pharisees. Don't give your money in a way that everybody can see and, and, and give you a bunch of show. Like, give in private. Don't even let your left hand know from the right hand what's going on. When you're fasting, don't tell everybody, oh, I'm so hungry, I've been fasting all day. Like, like put oil on your face, don't tell anybody. Let your, let your religion be of the heart and pure and sincere before God. Don't do it as a show. The Pharisees hated him for this. And this excuse of I need more signs is nothing more than a mask to cover up their hearts of disbelief. They don't want to obey God. They want to be disobedient. And look what Jesus says to them. He looks them in the face and he says, this is evil. And right there, family, we are seeing something really important. It's our second point for today. Number two, take a notes, write this down. Jesus sees our hearts and he hates our sin. And underline and circle that word hates because I think it confronts an idea that many in our culture have of who Jesus is that needs to be confronted. And maybe some of you here today have the same idea of Jesus and I wanna let the word of God confront you. There's a lot of people, you go to the mall this afternoon. Does anybody go to the mall anymore? I don't think we, we really do that. You go to Amazon this afternoon, I'm just kidding. You go, go to the mall, go to the food court and talk to people and just ask them, who's Jesus? You're gonna hear a lot of, well, Jesus is love. This idea, this concept of like hippie Jesus that he just, you know, he, he loves everybody, you know, everybody can come to Jesus, he just gives them a big group hug, Jesus is my homeboy, Jesus is my boyfriend, all that mentality of, of Jesus just accepts you just the way you are, he would never say a word to confront you, that's a very modern and, and popular consensus in our culture. There's churches out there that will say, you don't have to leave your sin, you don't have to leave lifestyles that God tells us in his word are against, uh, against him purely uh, sinful. You don't have to leave that stuff. Jesus accepts you the way you are. There's people that will say that again and again. I call this uh, squishmallow Jesus. And if you have kids, you know what squishmallows are? So, so I took a picture. These are my kids' squishmallows. Um, and these aren't even all of them. They're just the ones that I could find. Uh, my daughter uh, helped me arrange them in this wonderful, beautiful fashion. Thank you, Emmy, for your help. Um, but Squishmallows are like the modern day Beanie Baby. Like you remember Beanie Babies, I'm sure. 20, 25 years ago, these little weird little toys became like the craze of, of uh, our nation. Um, tiny little toys that were filled with beans. Beanie Babies, what they called them. Everybody had them. Well, now Beanie Babies, I, I don't think they're a thing anymore. But at least for my kids, Squishmallows are the thing. And they love them because they are so soft. I wish a, a picture doesn't really even help you understand a Squishmallow because the secret is in how soft they're made. Like these things are, are filled with stuffing and their, their fabric is just like, it's made out of angel hair. It's just like the, the, the best thing ever. And so, and kids love them because they're like, they're all round, they look like marshmallows and you can squish them, hence the name, Squishmallow. And you just hold them, you snuggle them at night, you can sleep on them like a pillow. You know, they, they, kids, kids love them, they'll never talk back to a kid. They just, they just are there to hug them. Family, that's how people view Jesus in our culture today. So many people want to imagine a Jesus that's not real at all, that just looks at your sin and says, that's okay, I love you anyways. I, I think this passage is here to pop the bubble on that kind of thinking. Jesus is staring sin in the lives of these Pharisees, and he doesn't say, it's okay, I've got grace for you. He says, you're evil. This is sin, it's consistent with what we see through the whole Bible that God, when he sees sin in his justice and holiness, he hates it. He's not okay with it at all. And the hatred isn't towards you. The hatred isn't towards the Pharisees. He loves the Pharisees. Therefore, he hates what's destroying their life. Their sin is gonna corrupt their souls in this life and it'll destroy them forever in the next life. He hates sin because sin destroys us. But, but in no way does he look at people who are, who are in the midst of, of rebellion and and offer a calm and comforting hand. Jesus confronts sin. In your life right now, we, we just talked about obedience for a while. If there are places in your life where you are not being faithful to the word of God, where you're hearing but you just keep disobeying, 
I mentioned a few of them earlier, money, marriage, uh, bitterness, and, and woundedness in relationships. But if there's other ones, and you know them, we've, we've talked about them in the past. Pastor Anton brings this up all the time. If there's places in your life where you're sinning, Jesus is not okay with that. He wants change to happen. Jesus is a God of love, absolutely, but he's also a God of justice. And he's not willing to let you continue in uncorrected sin. His love refuses to stand by idly while you walk in ways that will destroy your soul. In love, he rebukes. In love, he confronts. He sees all the way down to our souls, and anything he finds there that's competing with him for worship, he confronts. That's what he's doing with the Pharisees. Do you see it in their souls? Are they worshiping God? They think they are. They have this cover of godliness in their lives. They are self-deluded and deceived, thinking that they're godly people, but who are they worshiping in their hearts? Themselves. They love God because he elevates them. They love God because he gives them power. They love God because he gives them control over their lives, family. Anytime Jesus looks past your skin, past your mask, down into your heart, and he sees things that you're worshiping that aren't him, family, he will confront you in the same way. And hear me, it's always love. It's a hatred of your sin, a confrontation of love. Jesus sees evil and he hates it. That's the rebuke he gives them, but it's not all that's happening in this passage. His words also have an analogy, a comparison that we need to see. I want, I want you to see this clearly. It, it's, it's meant to help these Pharisees see themselves, see Jesus, see who he is. It's all wrapped up in these references to Jonah and this queen of the south. What, what's going on here? Well, to grasp these, you need to know the stories of Jonah and the queen of the south. So I'm going to give you a quick overview. We don't have time to go through the whole thing. You probably know about Jonah if you grew up in church. Jonah was swallowed by what? A whale, a big fish, something like that. Yeah, this, his story, he was a prophet of God. His story is found in the book of Jonah in the Old Testament. And he was sent by God to a city called Nineveh to preach against their sin. So Nineveh was this great city. We're told it took three days to walk through the city. So an enormous city, city. It was up in uh, the kingdom of Assyria at that time, which was one of the great world powers at that time, one of the greatest cities in Assyria. Um, and, and God sees this city and he sees their wickedness piled as high as heaven. So these are Gentiles, they're not Jews, they don't have the law of God, but they're walking not just in ignorance to God's law, they're walking in open rebellion to everything God cares about. I don't know what kind of sin, it doesn't tell us in the book of Jonah, but a lot of awful sinfulness, and God decides he's going to destroy the city of Nineveh. In 40 days, he's going to destroy it, but before he destroys it, he decides to send a warning through Jonah. Jonah doesn't like this plan. He hears the plan and he runs the opposite direction. God has to use a storm and then a big old fish to bring him back to the start. God tells him again, you got to go this way to Nineveh. Um, and when he finally goes, his message to the Ninevites is really simple. It's found in Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. I think we have this for the screens. Jonah began to go into the city, going a whole day's journey. So he's near the middle at this point. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's his message. One sentence. I mean, he probably said more than that, but that was the heart of his message. God's going to overthrow your city. Doesn't like your sin. It wasn't a message of God loves you. Jesus is here for you. It was a message of your sin is abhorrent to God. And look what, how they respond. Verses 5 and 6. The people of Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king, even the king of the city. And he arose from his throne. He removed his robe. He covered himself with sackcloth and he sat in ashes. It's an unthinkable response. But long story short, seeing their repentance, God relents. He gives life and salvation to the city. He doesn't destroy it. That's the story of Jonah. That's what you need to have in your mind. Secondly, the queen of the south, who is she? Real quickly, let me show you this. First Kings chapter 10 is where she is found. She shows up during the reign of King Solomon. You remember him, the, the, the son of David, king filled with wisdom, um, uh, fill, filled with wealth. Uh, God gives him all this amazing wealth because he was faithful to him in so many ways. But uh, the, the queen of the south, in, in 1 Kings, she's called the queen of Sheba, which is uh, the area we think it is in Ethiopia today, uh, southern Egypt, sort of uh, deep, uh, further down into Africa, south of Israel, of course. Well, she gets word of this king up in Israel who's you know, incredibly wise and full of wealth. And so the queen seeks him out. She makes a, a multi-month journey, makes a caravan to go up and see this guy Solomon. And she ends up, the story's really cool, she ends up praising God. 
She sees all this wealth. She hears Solomon's wisdom. And as a result of seeing God's blessing on Solomon, she ends up praising Yahweh and glorifying God's name. So both of these stories Jesus brings up. And the Pharisees in this moment, hear me, Jesus is speaking in the crowd. The Pharisees 100% would have been familiar with these. They're students of the Old Testament. They know the law. They, they, they know these stories. And here is the analogy that Jesus is making with them. In both stories, Nineveh and with the queen of Sheba, God breaks into spiritual blindness with grace. These are Gentiles, Ninevites, Ethiopians. They don't worship God. They are blind to the things of God. They're blind to God's law. They're blind to God's character. They don't have the, the scriptures. Yet in their spiritual darkness, in both cases, God breaks in. For the Ninevites, he breaks in by sending Jonah to them. And for the queen of the south, he breaks in by drawing her up to Jerusalem. But in both cases, he breaks into spiritual brokenness, spiritual blindness, and a wrath that is surely coming with grace, and he saves them. And here's what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. Here you are today, and God's doing the very same thing. Something greater than Solomon is here before your very eyes. Something greater than Jonah is here before your very eyes. Greater grace has come running for you, and you're staring it in the face right now. It's being offered freely to you, yet you refuse to believe. You're hardened in disbelief. And at the day of judgment, they're going to stand. These people who are not of the family of God, they're going to be able to stand and condemn you, and you will fall because you did not receive the grace that has come running for you. And right here, family, right here in the midst of their rebellion, we're seeing our third point today. Grab your pen. This is the glorious good news that we call gospel around here. Number three, Jesus pursues sinners with grace. The Pharisees are refusing to see this, but let's not be blind to the biggest thing happening in this passage right here. Jesus is pointing his grace and his love towards these Pharisees. And it's the same grace, the same love he pointed towards the Ninevites and towards the Queen of the South back in the Old Testament. No, he's not squishmallow Jesus. No, he doesn't just see your evil and say, come close anyways. He hates evil. He abhors it. One day he will pour out his wrath upon it for all who have not received him in faith. But he does that. He hates evil in order to save our souls. And when he sees our evil, he doesn't run the other direction like we would. He runs towards us to give us grace. He breaks through in the darkness to offer grace. Just think about Nineveh for a moment. Think about how crazy this story is. They're not the people of God. God has no obligation whatsoever to show them grace. They, they're living in, this, in sin and wickedness that has piled up to heaven. It would be nothing but just for God to destroy that city. The only thing they deserve is wrath being poured out upon them. They've rebelled against God. Maybe they didn't have the law, but Romans chapter 1 tells us that even without the law, we know God's real. His invisible qualities, his, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen in the things that have been made. The people of Nineveh in every sunrise and in every sunset knew God was real and knew that he was to be worshiped and yet they went their own way. They were living in rebellion and sin and God had zero obligation whatsoever to enter into their sinful mess and offer grace, but he did it. In kindness, in mercy, in grace, and in love, totally undeserved, he goes running for the people of Nineveh. He sends Jonah to them to warn them. And when Jonah runs, he uses a storm and a whale to bring him back and still gets him there. And with just one sim simple sentence, it works. Why? Because God was softening the hearts of the people of Nineveh so that they would receive the truth with joy. Does he confront them? Absolutely. Does he hate their sin? Absolutely. But he pursues them nonetheless. That's what I want you to see here. God sees our sin and he hates it but he's pursuing us with grace nonetheless. And here with this generation that's so evil before his eyes, with these Pharisees, though they are equally sinful, he's doing the exact same thing. Jesus himself, God himself from heaven, has come running to save them. And here they are asking for a sign, and Jesus is saying, you have it, I'm the sign. When he says no sign will be given you except for the sign of Jonah, he's saying, I'm the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was this sign of God's love for the people of Nineveh, I'm the sign of God's love for you. I left heaven to come for you. I'm going to go to a cross and lay down my life for you. Just like Jonah lived in a fish for three days, Jesus is going to be buried for three days because he's going to pay for the sin that we deserve. Jesus' death on the cross, if you've never understood it before, it was a death of propitiation, of atonement, him being killed because we deserve to be killed. 
And him saying, I'll die instead. I'll be a substitute. I will bear the wrath that their sin deserves so that they can go free. And he laid in that tomb for three days. And just as Jonah came out of that fish with a message of grace for the people of Nineveh, Jesus came out of that tomb with a message of grace that's gone through the entire earth family. In Jesus, we have salvation and forgiveness of our sins. Yes, he hates evil, but he comes running after sinners with grace. It's Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It's an incredible verse where Paul teaches us God shows his love for us in that we will, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <laughs> while we were sinners, before we had turned. Some of you in your mind, you are just lying, just exactly like the Pharisees. You think that your favor with God is because you turned. Because you're doing all these holy things, you're building for yourself a self-righteousness to make God pleased with you. But this passage says, before we had turned, while we were still sinners, while we're still in Nineveh living in our wickedness, God comes running for us. That's the beauty of the gospel. Not that you figured anything out, but that God came running for you before you had figured it out. Don't misunderstand who Jesus is. Yes, he hates sin, but he loves sinners and he comes running for them. And for everyone, everyone who just like the Ninevites will turn, will repent, will put on sackcloth and ashes and begin to bow before him, he will save. And all of this brings us to our final point, number four, where we'll close today. Some people refuse to see Jesus and receive his grace. Incredible grace offered, unmerited mercy granted, but there's many people standing in that crowd that day, living in our world today, maybe sitting in this room right now, who will see Jesus and the free offer of grace that he offers and will reject it all. And we see this in our final verses. Jesus' final words here, verses 33 through 36. Let me show these to you. No one, Jesus says, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, but when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. Okay, anybody else confused? (laughs) So Monday, as I'm first reading this passage, I literally had the thought, did Luke mess up? Like, did he take words from somewhere else and accidentally put them in the midst of this conversation? Because what is going on here? Jesus is talking about judgment and Jonah and, you know, evil generation. And now suddenly he's talking about light and eyes and lamps. Like, what? What is happening here? which is one of the really good reasons why pastors should definitely read commentaries because when you are very confused, you can, you can stumble into truth because we stand in 2023 and there's been a lot of faithful men and women through the generations that have studied God's word deeply as well and we can glean from their wisdom. So as confused as I was, family, I am deeply convinced that this is not an error. This is no editing mistake. Like what Jesus is saying here is deeply connected with everything that's preceded it. Let me try to help you see what I see now. In verse 33, this lamp on the stand, I think that's a reference to Jesus himself. That God himself, you know, John chapter 1 tells us Jesus is the light of the world. That he came from heaven, God brought light into this dark world. And that was Jesus, the disciples saw him. That Jesus was, was set up as a lamp in this world so that all of us could see him. God did not hide him. He didn't put him in a hidden place. He wanted the light of Christ to shine so that all could see him. But there's two ways to see him. There's two groups of people that see Jesus differently. This is the part about the eyes. First, verse 34 says, there's those who look on Jesus with healthy eyes, it says. Healthy eyes. What does that mean? The Greek there is really interesting. It's actually simple eyes, sincere eyes, unfolded eyes, like clear eyes. Just straight on looking at Jesus. No preconceived notions, you know, no other thoughts in their head that are distracting them. They're just looking clearly at Jesus. That might be the best way. Look clearly at Jesus. And when they look, they're looking at Jesus, the light of the world, 
that light comes straight into their body. Their eyes become this lamp and their whole body, it says, becomes full of light. That when you see Jesus clearly, he, his light enters you and changes everything about you. It goes all over your body, whole body filled with light. Your mouth starts to change. The way you talk is different in light of the light. The, the way your hands, your, your feet move in light of Christ's light begins to shift. Everything is transformed because of the light of Christ entering you. So much so that verse 36 says you start becoming bright in the world. You, you start like being a little light, a little lamp that's reflecting the light out to the people around you. It's the first group, healthy eyes, looking at Christ clearly. But then there's the second group, Jesus says, those who look not with healthy eyes, but with bad eyes, verse 34 says. And the Greek there, it's not just bad, it's actually evil. Look on Jesus with evil eyes. It's the same word that he uses back there in verse 29. This generation is an evil generation. What does that mean? Well, contrasted with the healthy eyes, these are duplicitous eyes is I think the best way to describe it. Eyes that are looking at Jesus but squinting. Untrusting eyes, doubting eyes, disbelieving eyes, evil eyes. They look, but they're not looking clearly. They're looking with, a, with an edge to them. The way the Pharisees looked at Jesus that he was a threat to their power, that he was coming to take what they love most. Family, it's the truth we see in John chapter 3, verse 19. We all know John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, he sent his only son so that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. Whoever, wide open gate, wide open door, anyone can come to Jesus if they'll just see the beauty of Christ and repent and believe. But the verse that follows, three verses later, verse 19 says this, the, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. Some people like their evil. They like their own life first and they look at Jesus with this sense of despise, their evil eyes, Jesus says. And Jesus says, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. How can that be? How can light be darkness? Well, it can't, obviously. What Jesus is saying there is be careful. Some people think they have light inside them, think they're right with God, think the light has shown into their hearts, but it's all darkness, family. That's where the Pharisees were. They had the mask. They had the cover. They looked like godliness. Everybody thought they were right with God, but under that mask, there was nothing but unbelief, hard hearts that refused to give up their power, refused to surrender to the lordship of God. They dismissed the words of Jesus. They dismissed the powers and the miracles of Jesus because it would have cost them everything. They thought they had light. It was only darkness. They wouldn't look at him. They wouldn't look at Jesus clearly. All they saw when they looked at Jesus was what it would cost them. They wouldn't look at what they would gain. He's standing before their face, but they refuse to see. They're part of the many on the broad path that leads to destruction that hear the offer of free grace from Christ and refuse to see Jesus and receive his grace. So family, I just want to ask. We're here this morning. It's Labor Day weekend. It's, it's September. On this morning, can I ask you this question? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen your sin and the grace that he offers on the other side of it? Have you been confronted by Jesus and the way he confronts every single one of us? When you see Jesus, two things happen. Number one, you feel awful. You get the confrontation where you realize you've been living in rebellion against God and everything's wrong. You deserve his wrath, you're a sinner, you've fallen short of his glory. Like the, the glimpse of Jesus, the first part of it is always painful. But right there in the midst of it, as we're feeling so hopeless, then you see the light bursting through the dark clouds and you see the comfort of Christ. That even though we're sinners, he went to the cross to pay for our sin. Even though we've run from him, he comes running for us. Even though we could never fix it and never earn our way back to him, he did all the work, so simply through faith we can be saved. Have you seen Jesus? One look will do it. One glimpse of that light, it'll shift everything in your life. Paul saw it. The apostle Paul saw it on the road to Damascus. One glimpse of the light and he was changed forever. He went from murdering Christians to being the greatest missionary the church has ever seen. 3,000 men and women saw it on the day of Pentecost. They saw the light, the first converts of the early church. They saw the light as Peter preached. You go read Acts chapter two, you'll hear this story. 
Chapter two, he finishes his sermon and, and the people were cut to the heart, it says. They saw Jesus, they saw their sin, and they were cut to the heart and they said, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and believe. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. Follow Jesus and you'll be saved. They saw the light that day. Zacchaeus saw it, that wee little man up in the sycamore tree. The Ethiopian, the Ethiopian eunuch saw it in Acts chapter 8. Cornelius saw it in Acts chapter 10. Lydia saw it in Acts chapter 16. St. Augustine, the great theologian, saw it while he was reading Romans 13. He's sitting under a tree. He's been seeking after God his whole life. He can't seem to be right with God. His heart is in turmoil. He's reading Romans 13, and he says that the sky's opened. Not literally, but he just saw the light of Christ. Martin Luther had the same experience. The great reformer, reading Romans chapter one, he saw the light. Charles Spurgeon, go read his testimony. It is so good. He saw it one snowy morning in a cloudy, dark blizzard sitting in a pew in a church in England. He saw the light of Christ and everything shifted. Family, every saint who has ever been saved, this is the same experience we've all had. We've seen the horrors of our sin and the beauty of the gospel. We've seen the light of Christ and it comes bursting through. And all you can do is fall. All you can do is humble yourself and say, thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Thank you for taking my place and earning for me something I could never earn for myself. Have you seen the light? Salvation is not by works, family. You could never dress yourself with good enough clothes to stand before the throne of God. The Pharisees kept trying. Self-righteousness was their way of trying to be right with God. It isn't enough. Those rags can't clothe you. Only the righteousness of Christ can save you. Your obedience doesn't save you. Looking at Jesus and seeing him clearly saves you. And then guess what happens? Obedience follows. The light comes bursting in. Everything becomes light. The darkness begins to go away as God's light changes you. It's all connected. True disciples obey, absolutely, but they obey because they've been changed by the light. You must look, family. You must look upon Jesus. We're all done. In just a moment, the band will come and lead us in a song of response as we always do here at Emmaus, a chance for all of us to reflect on what we've heard, to respond in the ways that God's spoken, to not just hear the word, but begin that process of letting that seed go deep into our hearts with response. As always, the tables for the Lord's Supper are open in the back of the room for all of you in this room who have trusted in Christ, who have seen the light of Jesus, who have repented of your sin and trusted in him and his free offer of grace for you, go and remember Jesus. Go and take the bread and take the juice and remember the body that was broken for you, the blood that was shed for you. Every time you go to these tables, that's what you're doing. You're remembering the sacrifice of Christ by which you were saved. You're standing once again in the light, looking once again at the light and saying, God, thank you. Thank you for the cross. You repent afresh of any sin in your life. So go, go to these tables. Remember the body and the blood. and Remember the grace of Christ that came running for you as you were still in your sin. But as you go, I think we all need to respond in a few various ways. I think there's maybe three groups of us in this room, if I could try to summarize Based on this passage, what we've talked about, three different types of responses, three different types of people in this room that, that might need to respond in different ways. First, maybe you're like the Ninevites. Like maybe you're here this morning and for you, you've been living in sin. You've been living in wickedness. You've been ignorant to God. You've been ignorant to his love, blind to the truth of his grace. And today God's calling you to repent. He's confronting you with the beauty of the gospel maybe for the first time. So repent. Do exactly what the Ninevites did. Put on sackcloth, not literally, but in your heart. Repent, fall on your knees before the Lord and beg him to forgive you. He'll do it. Heart level grief over our rebellion is where salvation begins. Repentance and faith in Christ. So repent, turn from the wrath that God has for sinners and take refuge in the grace of God that he's given in Christ. But maybe you're not like the Ninevites, maybe you're like the Pharisees. Maybe you're here this morning and you've got all the appearances of godliness. You've got the mask of church down to, you know, down to science. But you know Jesus isn't your Lord. Because you're quite sure you don't need one, thank you very much. You reject the idea of hell. You don't see the problem of sin. You don't think you're far from God. Though everyone around you thinks you're a Christian, in your heart, you've never let the Lord reign. 
you kind of frustrated with Jesus. I mean, you're here along for the ride, but if you're honest with yourself in your heart, you do not, you have not returned to Jesus. You have not repented of your sin. Jesus is not your Lord. For you, this, the response is the same. Repent, humble yourself. There's no salvation in your own works. You will get to the end of this life and the queen of Sheba, the, the Ninevites, they'll stand and condemn you too together with these Pharisees. There's grace only for those who have repented of their sin. You will not get to heaven on your own laurels. Only through Christ, only by repenting and turning to him will you be saved. So do it, repent right now. Trust in Christ and be saved. Maybe the third group would be the people in this story that were standing beside Jesus, the disciples. Maybe you're like Peter, James, and John. You're hearing all this and, you know, your heart's filled with joy. You're remembering when you first saw the light. You're warmed by this message because you're remembering the way the light has shifted your life. You're, you're remembering all the ways God has changed you. For you, I, I just want to pull your eyes to verse 35 real quick as we conclude. The warning Jesus gave there. Jesus said, be careful lest the light in you is darkness. And I just want to remind you that right beside James and Peter and John, Judas was standing there in the crowds as well. And there's a way that you can have yourself deceived that you are really walking in the light, but it's all about you. And you're using the things of God to elevate yourself. And Jesus is, again, fine to be on a frame in your heart, but you have not let him sit on the throne. Family, repent. I'm not saying you need to be saved. Perhaps you are saved. Perhaps you have seen the light and truly trusted in Christ, but maybe it's time to actually let him have control, to walk in obedience. If there's places in your life where you've been, you know, not letting the word take root, not letting obedience happen because you just can't figure out how to do it, family, figure it out. Seek him, let him lead. His his plan is good. There's always blessing on the other side. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how how high that mountain of obedience seems. On the other side of the mountain, there's joy and blessing and abundance. Jesus is calling you towards it. So go, look at him once again. Let the light of his countenance fill you once again. Be shaped as that light comes in. Family, we have a great savior. He's not okay with our sin, but he comforts us and comes running with us, running after us with grace even as he confronts our sin. And with amazing, glorious light from heaven, he cleans and heals every part of our broken souls. Look at him. Look at him and live and be changed forever. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your holy confrontations, your holy rebukes, your righteous anger towards our sin that breaks through and leads us out of rebellion. We need these kind of words sometimes, Lord. So I, I just, I pray for everyone in this room right now. I pray whether they're Ninevites living in abject rebellion of you, whether they're Pharisees sort of faking it with this mask of spirituality, or whether they're disciples that have just fallen off track, God, I pray right now for all of us, Lord, you'd lead us back to you. I pray you'd burst through the dark clouds of our heart with your glorious light. You would let light shine into the darkness and that we would not love our sin more than you. We would not love our power and our comfort and whatever idol we're worshiping more than you. But we'd bend. We'd not have a stiff neck to your grace, but we'd be supple to your spirit. We'd bend and bow to you today. Lord, would you save sinners right now? If there's any in this room who are seeing your light for the first time, God, would they cast themselves at your feet, Lord, and would you do to them what you've done to all of us who have been saved? Would you redeem them and clean their sin and forgive them of their sin and set them back on their feet? You went to the cross as a demonstration of your love for us, and you solved the problem of sin there. You defeated sin. You defeated Satan. You defeated death. And the Bible is clear, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Father, for any who need to do that right now, would you prompt them in their heart? Would they cry out to you? Would you save them with your glorious grace? As we go to these tables, would we all remember that grace? Would we look upon it once again and let your light come flooding in? We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Let us not just be hearers. Let us obey. It's in your name we pray.